Good morning. It's good, each, good to see each one of you here this morning. Good to see some visitors with us this morning also. I don't know why this message lays so heavy upon me this morning. Some messages are hard to study and easy to give. This one was easier to study and is hard to give. Is it because, I don't know, is it because Satan doesn't want me to give it or is it because I know that some of you here will not agree with me? but I feel like I need to give it. Turn with me to 1 John 4. I know I had a devotions a couple months ago, kind of on this subject. I know Terrell's talked about having a message and I believe it'd be appropriate for him to have it next Sunday if that's what he feels led to have. But we are living in a world that is behaving in reaction to fear, I believe. And I want to look at that this morning. First John 4, beginning at verse Chapter, yeah, 1 John 4, beginning at verse 15. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God loveth his brother also. This morning, I want to focus in on verse 18. We're seeing a lot of fear. We're seeing people behave in ways that a year ago I, couldn't, I could not imagine. I don't know about you. And there's lots of opinions of why people are behaving the way they do. But I believe a lot of it's coming from fear. Fear of the unknown, fear of the change that's happening in this country. So what does it mean when it says there's no fear in love? Do you have fear? If I asked any of you one-on-one -on -one in a private conversation, I would say there's something you fear, there's something you struggle with. Whether it's daily, weekly, monthly, or yearly, there's something that causes you to pause, causes you to stop. Maybe it even affects your behavior at times. So is fear wrong? It says there's no fear in love. What kind of love is it talking about here? I believe when the verse, verse 18 here, whenever it uses the word love, it's speaking either of God or his love or both. So I believe it's saying that there is no fear with God's love. 
So if we claim to be a child of God, if we claim to walk with him, fear should not be controlling us, should not be dictating our reactions and our behavior. And it's quite clear when it says no fear. It doesn't say most fear, a little fear. It's no. So there's absolutely no fear. Used to be a popular saying, you'd see it on the back of pickup trucks and bumper stickers, no fear. For guys who wanted to be tough and say they didn't really have any fear of anything. But I don't believe it was completely true. They might have had courage to do dangerous things, but if you really pushed them into a corner, there would be something they were afraid of. If nothing else, they were afraid that someone else would think they're fearful, right? But this says no fear. There's no fear where God's love is present, where God is present. What is the mean definition of fear here? We know that some verses in the Bible where it talks about fear, it's talking of the respect, the honor given to God. When it says that we should fear God, it doesn't mean we're living in terror of God, alarm. But this is what this word means here. When it says there's no fear, it's talking about terror or alarm. Have we seen that today? People behaving with alarm, with terror. We're seeing it all around us. This week, there was a news article that made national news. A 29-year-old hockey coach died of COVID. How many saw that article this week? Good. I'm glad not very many of you saw it. Four months ago, that article would have scared me, would have put fear into me because there were articles like that four months ago. Why was that article put out? It was to make us fear. It was to make young people fear COVID. Now, what if you read that article? What if you got dug down into that article deeper, you found that there was more to the story? The person took sleeping pills to try to aid his sleep, but he was fighting respiratory issues with COVID. The doctor's belief is that the combination, what led to his death, but if you put that with no context, what does that do to us? It gives us fear. We're having that all around us. We're being bombarded with narratives, with stories, with things that may be true, but they're not in context and they're causing fear. We need to be careful that we're not a part of it. I also don't believe we need to be out there I have a coworker who got into a heated Facebook back and forth with someone over that article. I don't believe that's as believers, that's what we're called to do. Make sure everybody knows the truth about such and such. But I want us to have these things in context. If you're living in fear of COVID and you're under 40, here's, here's some data, here's some context to put with it. Out of Indiana's 3,278 COVID deaths as of last night, only 1.1% of those are 40 and under. 36 people out of 3,278 in Indiana were under 40. Nowhere in that article was that context put in as part of the story. When eight, verse 18 talks about love, it's talking about the love of God. It, it, we, what are we doing? Are we giving into fear 
or are we allowing God's love to help us put perspective on what we're seeing? Then the verse says, but perfect love casteth out fear. The word but, we're going we're gonna to dive into that, can mean different things. It can mean contrary rise, this, but that. Proverbs does that a lot. You know, if you do this, this will happen. But if you do this, this will happen, right? But the definition here is, therefore. So there's no fear in love. Therefore, perfect love casteth out fear. Who is that perfect love? God. We need to keep God foremost in our hearts and our minds. Why does... Why does perfect love cast out fear? Because it has no place where God is. It goes on to say, because fear hath torment. Can God's love allow torment or cause torment? Maybe, maybe you can disagree with me and may, you, know, there, you maybe have an example. But I don't believe here on earth, God's love causes torment torment those who reject God's love still receive his mercy and grace here on earth now when they meet our judgment the fact that they rejected God's love will lead to torment but here on earth I believe this is true that because, his, because of God's love casting out fear, it cannot cause... So if we have fear, it causes torment. How many people see, seem tormented today? Living in fear. The suicide rates are way, way up. Why? People are tormented by fear. And in the last part of the verse, he that feareth, is not made perfect in love. If you're struggling with fear today, I don't want to make you give up, make you do even more fearful or discouraged. I want to give you hope. I want to encourage you because that's what God wants to do. That's what God is actively doing. He wants to take away our fear. It says, he that feareth is not made perfect in love. Does this mean it will never have fear? I believe we'd all agree that's not true. There's times where we fear something. Sometimes that fear is good. Sometimes it's not. Those of you who ever um, stood at the top of a diving board to jump into a pond, you had some fear. If you know how to swim well, what are you fearful of? Not much, right? If you don't know how to swim like me, my fear is well warranted because if I jumped off, unless someone jumped in to save me, I would drown. Fear of death is sometimes healthy unless it becomes so overpowering that we cannot live in a healthy, godly way. Six months ago, we didn't know with COVID. There was times where I had some fear. I was reading articles and people my age and younger, healthier than me were dying. But I just want to give some numbers this morning. I am trying not to be political. Please do not take it that way this morning. But I'm trying to put things in perspective to help us not fear. Is COVID real? Yes. Don't, please don't call me a denier. 
but I believe that God controls and determines our death, our time when we're done. Please bear with me. I enjoy numbers more than others. I understand that, but just go through it quickly. Try to make it clear and distinct. We hear a lot of comparisons of right now with the Spanish flu of 1918. Some of them are warranted. Um, the way cities have struggled, that happened in 1918. Um, the way this, the flu started in other countries and spread to the US, similar to COVID. Put into perspective, US population in 1918 was close to 104 million. Today we have 326 million, so just about, just over three times. The U.S. Death, the U.S. deaths in, in, 2000, in 1918 was 675,000. U.S. deaths to date, 204,000. We're on course to potentially hit 280 this year of COVID. But let's put that in perspective. I remember hearing stories about the 1918 pandemic. And it was scary to hear those stories. But yet in my mind, it's like, well, that could never happen today, right? And yet, many people are reacting today as if COVID is exactly like 1918. But let's put it in perspective. In, 2000, in 1918, the death rate ended up at 0.65%, which is six and a half people per thousand people. To date, we are at six per 10,000, so one-tenth of that. And if it hits 280, it would be point oh, I said it wrong, point oh six six three percent six per 10,000. If we hit 280, it would be point oh eight percent so a zero after the decimal point of a percent or almost one person for every thousand versus the six and a half of the Spanish flu. I'm not here to argue about whether these numbers are right or wrong. I'm taking these from national data things. That's not the point. It's to put it in perspective. People today are living in so much fear that they feel like people are dropping like flies. And yes, people are dying of it, but it's not the severity. But back to 1918, I remember hearing stories that um, family members, families losing multiple family members during it. That made it sound like that was that way across the U.S. I believe it was that way in some cities, certain neighbor, certain areas, certain communities. But as we see, it was six per ten thousand, six per six and a half per thousand. And so not all areas were nearly affected that badly. The most crazy story that I heard was from the 1918 one was that two men who got on a streetcar by the end of the route had died on the same streetcar. Stories like that, what are they meant to do? Make you fearful. Can you imagine how fearful it would have been to live, be alive in 1918? hearing a story like that. Now, do I believe these true stories aren't true? No, I believe they're true. But without context, they put fear into man. How bad was 1918? In one month, 200,000 people, the month of October, 2,000 people died. That was, uh, that was a lot of people. Basically, if the death rate in 1918 was the same as it was in 2019 per person, if you understand that that way. In, 19, in 2019, 7,800 people died every day in the US of something, cancer, heart disease, old, de old age, something. If that death rate was exactly the same in 1918, it would have meant that twice as many people died 
every day during that month of October. But yet you heard stories of bodies piling up just like we heard in, in April in New York City. Yes, um, it said that uh, undertakers and coffin makers couldn't keep up. That makes sense. If you had a coffin maker who was fully employed before, yes, he would now have to produce two coffins for every one coffin. But it's not as scary as they make it sound. We have to be careful. Are the stories being told to put fear in us? Even in New York City in the month of April, or New York City, sorry, New York State in the month of April, 20,000 people died. That is horrible, but yet it was only one-tenth of what the whole U.S. experienced in 1918 in the month of October. But let's put it in perspective. The Black Plague, which was a horrible, horrible pandemic, killed half of Europe's population. One out of two. If you remember, I said 1918 killed six and a half per thousand. The Black Plague killed in Europe one out of two or almost one out of two people. It's not the same. We need to be careful about the stories, the narratives that we believe. Once you take into account that the current COVID, that 50% of the deaths are 80 and above, and 25% are 70 and above, totaling 75%, many of the people that have died of COVID this year would not have lived a lot longer anyway. So like I said back again, don't call me a COVID denier, please listen to me. And it's just, I don't want us to live in fear. As we looked at scripture, fear is not where we're called to be as a Christian. Why am I talking about this across the pulpit this morning? Some of you may disagree with me doing that. But I believe we need to wake up. Something bigger is going on. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. There is something going on. What we're seeing around us does not match what we're seeing in the numbers, the reactions. They're not making sense. The peace and safety that Mennonites have enjoyed in America is, is changing, but God is still on the throne. I want us to remember that. Even if things get more violent, what we thought was what we could depend upon each day to be normal and steady around us, it's changing. It can be discouraging. It even appears to me that God is pulling back his protection on us as a country when you see the, the, the things going on. Just add it all together, a lot of the things that are going on. Where is it leading? What is it, what is it pointing to? And I believe the reason we can, we can have hope this morning is that it's pointing to the return of Christ. We don't have to live in fear because Christ is still standing at the right hand of the Father. God is still in control of what happens. Why do bad things happen if God is still on the throne to bring about his, his will on earth? We see the peace treaties that Israel has made in the last couple of weeks with Iran and UAE. Some of you may say well, that's a good thing. Others may say it's a bad thing. But no matter how, what you feel of them, they are leading us closer to the return of Christ. Whether you believe we're a racist country or not, no matter how you, no matter what your view on what's happening around us, if we are child of God, I believe we all recognize that Christ's return is closer. So in closing, I'd like to look at some scriptures related to that. Acts chapter 1, verses 9 to 12. The reasons we don't need to fear to help us understand why 
things are going the way they are, not just in the U.S., in the world. There are cities, there are protests, not just in the U.S., there are protests in cities around the world. There's upheaval. We have friends, acquaintances all through Central South America. They're all dealing with things that are changing. It's not just here. So what is what is going on? Acts nine, oh, ch- verse one, v- chapter one, verse nine. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, "Ye men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven." Then they returned unto Jerusalem from the Mount of Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. So just as soon as Jesus was taken up from earth, after his time on earth, after his resurrection, right away God makes known that Jesus is going to come back someday. And not only that he is, how he's going to come back. He's going to come back in the clouds. It's not going to be the same way he came the first time. Then let's turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. If you're not right with God this morning, then there is things, then there is something to fear the Lord's return. But if we are walking with him, walking with God, this should give us hope as we look around and see things in upheaval and things falling apart to recognize that Jesus will come back. He will make things right. It's to comfort us it's to encourage us. In, first, in John 14, verses 2 to 3, it says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. For these last 2,000 years, Jesus was in heaven. It talks about, the Bible talks about him being on the right hand of the Father, inner seating for us, being our advocate. But he's also been preparing a place for us. And that is encouraging. That is, gives us hope. Just as the Bible talks about Jesus being the bridegroom and the church being the bride, just as a bridegroom prepares a place for his bride to live once they're married, Jesus has been there for 2,000 years preparing for us a place. I hope that gives us hope, encourages us, even if things aren't the way we'd like them here. And then last of all, in closing, I want to read the verse again, 1 John 4, 18. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear is torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love, Let us turn to God. If we're struggling with fear this morning, if we don't know which way to turn, we don't know, maybe we're struggling just to do our daily activities because of fear. Let us call out to God and ask for him to become closer to us, to for a closer relationship with him because God wants to cast that fear out. Lord bless you.